Professor of Urban and Regional Planning here at the University of Sydney, and I'm also the director of the Henry Halloran Research Trust, which runs this Festival of Urbanism. And I'm very, very delighted to introduce you to this Festival of Urbanism event. But before we go any further, let me acknowledge that we are here today on the unceded lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And it's on their country that the University of Sydney's campuses um, lie. And as we share our knowledge here, our teaching, our learning and our research practices within the university and beyond, it's very important to pay our respects to the knowledge that is embedded forever within Aboriginal custodianship of country. And with that, I pay my respects to the traditional owners of this land as well as to past, present and emerging. And I extend those respects to any Aboriginal people who might be with us here today. I'd also like to note that the Sydney School of Architecture, Design and Planning has um, strongly supported the um, the state that has released a statement, and I commend that statement to you, that is strongly in support of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice to parliament. So, as I said at the outset, it's my great privilege to, to welcome you here to this Festival of Urbanism event. The Festival of Urbanism is now in its 10th year. It's a public program of events run by the Henry Halloran Research Trust, which is a cross-university uh, research centre that is dedicated to fostering multidisciplinary research on cities and regions and urban communities, and doing so in dialogue with the research community, with government, with industry, with the profession, and absolutely with the wider community as well. And the Festival of Urbanism is our flagship program of public events for promoting that evidence-informed dialogue. So tonight's event on platforms, technologies, technology, cities and urban life is obviously extremely topical. And it's a very good example of how we run our festival events here with a combination of researchers from the University of Sydney and beyond, as you'll learn in a moment, as well as um, industry leaders. I'll introduce the chair of the event in a moment, but I also want to let you know that as soon as we're finished, at about five o'clock this evening, there'll be a, sh a short reception, and then at 5.30 there's another event on environmental law and biodiversity conservation happening here and of course you're welcome to stay for that event which will be followed by another uh, a longer reception and an opportunity to meet the speakers and carry on the conversation. So now I'm absolutely delighted to introduce the chair of tonight's session which is um, of course Dr Sophia Malson. Dr. Malson is Senior Lecturer here in the School of Architecture, Design and Planning at the University of Sydney, and her research looks at how technology might be, is, can be used to hack housing and support tenants amongst uh, other housing innovations. More widely, her work sits across urban spaces, governance, housing and feminism. And she looks at how digital technologies mediate and reconfigure relationships across these spaces. Welcome and thank you, Sophia. Thank you, Nicole, for that lovely introduction. And please stop the applause. I'm just the chair. Um, so it is my absolute pleasure to be here today to chair this session on contested platforms in, um, for the Festival of Urbanism. Uh, platforms and research around platforms are some of my most um, uh, main interest in terms of my research, but also as a, a person going about their daily lives because we encounter them in, in very everyday and mundane ways as well as the spectacular. So this session, contested platforms from Airbnb to the autonomous city will engage with the ongoing concerns about the localised impacts of globally owned platforms on the ways in which we use our homes and cities. 
from the housing market and neighbourhood impacts of Airbnb um, type platforms through to the less visible implications of automated urban systems. This session will ask how communities uh, can best understand and harness harness, sorry, digitalisation to create positive opportunities while managing risks, because that's an important point to note, that it's not all bad and it's not all good. Bit of column A, bit of column B. So we have a great lineup today um, with uh, four speakers who work across both academia and industry, so a nice rounded um, panel. Um, I will introduce them uh, in more depth as I ask them to come up um, to present, but the order of the session will be that the speakers come up and um, will present a little, and then we'll have questions and open Q&A discussion after that. I do already have some questions that have been sent in um, by the um, audience for the panel, so we'll be using those as well during Q&A time, but if you have any burning questions, um, save them for that, and we'll have roving mics going around so you can ask the panellists yourself. So first of all, it is my pleasure to invite Dr. Luke Hespinall um, to present. Dr. Hespinall is a senior lecturer in design at the University of Sydney and director of the Master of Interaction Design and Electronic Arts. His practice investigates the mediation of cities and culture through digital technologies across the fields of media architecture, digital storytelling, social and cross-cultural interactions, placemaking, urban informatics and smart cities. He's advanced discussion on these fields through numerous engagements with local government, industry, museums and academic institution. And he's currently leading an international collaboration with Utrecht University in the Netherlands around the emerging field of urban artificial intelligence and its implications to civic society. So Luke, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. I would like to kick off our conversation today by talking about civic participation and the potential impact that the growing use of urban technologies may have on our ability to conduct conversations and make decisions as a society. Um, our physical and virtual lives are pretty much indissociable. Uh, at this, these days uh, with the increasing use of technology. And there are two trends in particular that I feel of, uh, of concern that can be quite disruptive to our lives, and that, that's what we're going to be talking about, these notions of augmented and autonomous cities. So augmented city is this notion of having um, urban narratives that unfold through digital platforms, digital systems, and often online. And one example here that I'd like to talk about is the guerrilla projections that emerged in Latin America and in Brazil in particular at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. We had uh, citizens in lockdown in possession of projectors and it would turn the projectors back into the city to reoccupy, reclaim the city, uh, express messages of solidarity and um, the political uh, conversations and, and commentary and then so sharing that in social media, particularly on Instagram. And that became very popular. Other people started to do the same and became a community and turned into a platform It has been used for uh, public art festivals. I was actually involved in one of those part, uh, public art festivals. And it persists to this day. So again, this idea of creating, uh, using digital media to create a parallel almost narrative that's connected to the city but happens mostly online. That is the same sort of ability that uh, another technology that got popularized during the pandemic, the QR codes, offer, offer us. They work almost like what I would like to call um, city hyperlinks. So it's, if you're making the analogy to websites, they, with hyperlinks, they allow you to navigate from page to page. QR codes allow us to, from a physical space, navigate into a digital domain that may offer more information, that information that may change from time to time, may be used by governments, have been used by, for digital storytelling, by shop, shops and museums, and also for increasingly for activism. And also I've seen um, for conspiracy theory as well in many places. And that's not dissimilar from the, the dynamics that were um, unfolded by older kinds of platform, as we can refer to Airbnb, for example, today, uh, which, which is, again, creating this parallel narrative that unfolds online, promoting certain areas of the city, um, a particular narrative about those areas of the city for external audiences, 
this uh, selling uh, this idea idea of authentic experiences that would be affordable to them, and in the process um, increasing the, the the costs of that of that experience and potentially pushing out residents that and reducing the affordability of properties, and and then prompting uh, local governments to take action, changing policy to to curb the widespread use of of the, the Airbnb platform. Again, this idea of creating parallel narratives that may not even intersect with each other, may coexist and uh, unfold online and can potentially lead to fragmentation of uh, society and civic discourse, but can also lead to diversity. The other dynamics that I would like to talk about is the autonomous city, which is uh, the natural progression, you could say, of the smart city. So we've been using digital systems to automate um, processes and services in the city for a number of years now. But with the, the, the increasing affordability and widespread use of artificial intelligence, many of those systems now have the ability to analyze the data and make decisions by themselves without the intervention of humans. So the classic example being the autonomous vehicle, which is essentially a car without a driver, making decisions as it goes through the city uh, based on the input from the environment and with a very specific purpose, so, we, so which is to conduct people safely from A to B without damaging uh, an infrastructure and lives. Um, this is the use of AI as a tool, so it's a very specific purpose, um, uh, the, the, the natural progression of, from automation to autonomy. But if you think of more recent developments in artificial intelligence, and uh, things like ChatGPT, for example, you can think of AI as an assistant as well. So it's not inconceivable to think of this use in public spaces almost as a companion to civic uh, activities that may otherwise unfold by themselves, but like as a prompt, as, a, as a, almost like a, an assistance to help us to live civically with each other. So this is a prototype we developed here uh, a few years ago um, um, as a little robot that would draw on, with chalk on the floor and invite people to, to uh, collaborate, like with a digital placemaking proof of concept. And then you can go very wide, and there are already the talks about what has been called city brains, which are far wide, uh, city-wide uh, systems that would aggregate lots of data and make decisions potentially across the entire metropolis. So think about, to come back to autonomous vehicles, Rather than having one single vehicle, you might have a single system controlling the entire fleet of autonomous vehicles in the city, like one single intelligence across multiple bodies. And that has already been tried out um, in some places in Asia. The risk that I see here is, is pr primarily this triple passivity, as I call it, of autonomous city, where we as citizens have data being collect collected from us without we, we realizing this data is used by algorithms on, for which we have no input, to have no participation in the design and development of, and algorithms who are, which are making decisions that affect us, often without us even realizing that. So we, there is a risk that we may be completely locked out of any decision making and participation uh, about this entire apparatus of uh, the autonomous city. And therefore we need to balance those trade-offs and try to reclaim our civic participation and, again, make choices as a society between the benefits, potential benefits that augmented autonomous cities may bring in terms of plurality and um, civic, civic um, uh, conversation and helping us to live together, but also avoiding veering into polarization, increasing fragmentation, and um, the existence of an intelligent apparatus we, are, we have no participation on. So I think this is enough for us to get started, and I welcome your questions later on. Thank you. Thanks, Luke. Great paper uh, presentation to kick off on. Um, next up, we have Cecile Weldon. Um, Cecile is considered Australia's foremost expert on residential energy efficiency and the property marketing sector. So specifically in the convergence between sustainability, energy efficiency, property marketing and property value. 
Cecile has participated in numerous research projects over the, part, over the last 10 years and has held key advisory roles across property and research sectors. She's currently contracted to the CSIRO to provide insight into the systems, processes and sales conversations that underpin residential property marketing. She's an innovative thinker with a proven track record in an ability to see opportunities in unexpected places and enhance business and social sector growth. And most importantly, she's passionate about uncovering new opportunities to deliver better homes for all Australians. Um, so, Cecile, thank you. So I'm not currently contracted. I've finished the contract with the CSIRO. No, that's okay. Um, I'm free. Yeah. No, um, it's wonderful to be with you today. So I'm an entrepreneur and I'm representing the PropTech Association of Australia, which are a whole bunch of entrepreneurs. And this is emerging tech solutions for the property market. So I'm not going to go into here, but happy to talk to you about the prop, what the PropTech Association does. They're sort of the cool kids that are looking for solutions for all of the big problems, uh, a lot of them impact driven. So they span the entire breadth of the real estate life cycle. They're very agile and responsive, often data driven AI machine learning that challenge and enhance existing processes and pathways. Um, and I'm going to go into a little bit of detail into residential property, uh, not a big not such a big aspect of our cities in Australia, but certainly it will need to become that way. But first of all, where does our agency lie? I want to work from your individual level to begin with, and I've come up with a fun set of words here because I think we need to look at the skills that we need to be in this new world. Instead of just focusing on the existing skills and perceptions that we have and looking at that from that perspective. So first of all, there's an old fashioned word called discernment, the ability to look at both sides and find your way through them, rather than polarising all the time. This idea of curation, how many people have thousands of phones, uh, photos on their devices, can you start learning to curate them please, because we need to be able to do that. And this consent list literacy, understanding where our rights lie and, and really being familiar with that. Um, I had a knowledge management course that forced me to actually read the whole terms and conditions of an Apple iPhone. It was 41 pages. Um, I didn't want to know. Okay. Um, so also this idea of data customization rights. You know, what matters to me and can I get paid for it too, not just you. Um, um, an understanding of commercial data value, uh, curiosity, not cynicism, I'd really encourage. And I've just created a word because I like to do that. It's this idea of wonderment, which is the joy of being completely unpredictable. And I would encourage everyone to start to be that. Um, and of course, the ability to self-reflect. Are you a realist optimist or a realist cynic? because that will impact the way you see the world that's coming and that we're in currently and how you see your agency in it. Just for everybody's sake, I'm a realist optimist. Okay, so there's also two paradoxes that I want to leave hanging in the air a bit. Connectedness is not the same as belonging. And we can't see them as that. So I want to strongly, strongly make that point, especially to those people that are creating in the built environment, are creating spaces and experiences. They are not the same, but sometimes you will be told that they are. And the other thing is that you can be influenced by someone you don't trust. And happy to unpack that in the, um, in the panel discussion. So the residential property market is largely fragmented and that's because everyone's white knuckle competitive. Wow! <laughs> it's like CoreLogic, realestate.com, they're monoliths and they will not play nicely. Um, this gives an opportunity for us to observe some sort of nascent signs of things coalescing before huge platform, one platform might take it over. So um, it gives us a chance to really understand what does it look like when these platform players are forming? Because I think we're so used to looking at the ones already set, we don't recognise the signs of ones that are, that are forming and we don't use our agency to influence that. I want to deep dive on two um, property marketing touch points. One is the story, um, the assumptions around the data sets that we work on in the property industry, what, what did it, where did it begin? 
you know, what are the documents that started the data? The documents that were digitised, the digitisation that turned into really interesting data insights, touch points that were coalesced and joined together and commercialised. What was the first document? And I think we need to really start to interrogate how things began and whether that was the building blocks of inequality and that was the building blocks of a lie that everything is built on top of. So, the Torrens Title Land Registration System. Um, in 1835, Governor Burke, I think I've spelled his name wrong, um, Dick, he actually had the document, the proclamation of terra nullius. That's when it became law. Um, the land belonged to no one. We know this to be false. Now, actually, 23 years later, in 1858, the Torrens Title Land Registration was developed in South Australia, and it was based on that assumption. Okay? And currently, it's in many Commonwealth countries the whole system, created in Australia. In New South Wales, it um, started in 1863. Now, that's based, our whole property title system is based on the proclamation of Terra Nullius. How can that be? Because we all know in 1992, the Marbo case proved incontrovertibly that this was a lie. So how come? that our whole title, every time we buy a property and transact legally, we are continuing the colonial um, interpretation of land every day. So how come the law was in place there, but it didn't filter through to every part of our property transaction? So I, I found this incredible. And so I asked, how come? Um, I might get a chance to talk about where we went from that. But what's the impact of that? an embedded falsehood and a legal anomaly. The property data insight landscape on a national scale has been impacted that. The story of our cities is impacted. And how much does it still to this day covertly influence our pathways to finance, our personal experience of property ownership, and how does it directly and indirectly perpetuate trauma for our First Nations people? For instance, when you if you have the opportunity to own a property and you ask for your titles documents and you see it begins in, you know, 1870 and you look at that and you go, but that's not true. Can we put a document at the beginning of that? Wouldn't that be interesting? Then every time a property, oh my God, or at one minute and I've already, okay. <laughs> well, we'll leave the second anomaly behind. I'm not going to talk about this one. We'll get a chance to talk about it. Um, in the panel discussion. It's another opportunity to really disrupt the system. What I want to be able to say is um, we have a tremendous amount of agency. Fritjof Capra, who's somebody I really love, uh, enjoy reading, said that you cannot disrupt a system. All you can do is meaningly disturb it. And that's my role as an entrepreneur. I like to tickle existing systems and let new information flow through them. So when we look at these platforms coalescing, go back and look at the assumptions that they're built on, start interrogating where did that come from and see if we can disrupt it at the beginning before it becomes a platform player. Thank you. Fantastic, Cecile. And um, I was being unpredictable when I said you were still contracted out to the uh, CSIRO, you know. <laughs> um, wonderful. Um, next up, uh, we have Dr. Alan Mackay, who is Deputy Director of the Sydney Institute of Criminology and an academic fellow at the University of Sydney's Law School. He's trained as a solicitor in Scotland, practised as a commercial litigator in Hong Kong, and has also been admitted to practise in two Australian jurisdictions. So he's a very busy man. He was named by Australasian lawyer as one of the most influential lawyers of 2021 and again in 2023 for his work on neurotechnology and the law. Dr Mackay was also commissioned by the Law Society of England and Wales to write the report Neurotechnology, Law and the Legal Profession, which was published in August 2022. This world-first consideration of brain-computer interfaces and other forms of neurotechnology was reported by media sources around the world in over 20 countries. And the Law Society have recently published his 2023 update on neurotechnology. Um, and he's the author of the first peer-reviewed article on the challenges presented by neurotechnology for human rights in Australia. So this might be a good indicator of what he will be talking about here today. Thanks.
Well, thanks very much. Uh, Cecile's uh, talk just reminded me of uh, my first jurisdiction. I was a solicitor in Scotland, and um, we had a, a title system in which there were superiors and vassals. And I remember the, some of the early documents were so uh, old that they used to crumble onto my suit. So I had some unhappy, <laughs> unhappy memories from that. Uh, OK, but I'm going to talk about something very different. I'm going to talk about mo monitoring urban brains. Um, so I'm going to start off with uh, this, this uh, EG headset, which is a, a sort of brain monitoring device. And you can buy them um, in various grades, consumer ones, up to sort of uh, more, um, you know, better quality ones. And what it does is it reads neural activity from brains, and it might be used to control a device, so perhaps control a cursor, or interact with a smart home, like switching on lights, or changing a TV channel, or something like that. And there's other forms of neurotechnology, which I'll sort of get onto a bit later. Um, it's also been used in, in, in marketing and also in design, so, um, you know, you can, if, if you're a designer, you could ask somebody what they think of your d d design and maybe show them a VR um, representation of it, uh, but you can get a bit more uh, data about uh, their mental processes from a EG headset, which monitors the neural activity. And then another possible use of it, it that connects with cities is, is monitoring the brains of drivers, say a driver that's crossing the city, uh, monitoring a brain for lapses in it, attention. So, is there any reason to be concerned about this? So, recently, the um, Australian Human Rights Commission, they've priori prioritised neurotech as a, an area of uh, engagement. I'm going to talk about some of, their, some of the concerns that lead to that. I won't consider all neurotech. I won't consider therapeutic neurotech more just the kind of brain reading devices that monitor brains and might be used in a kind of urban context. So, as I said, a designer might use it, and some architects have, in, in some architecture schools and uh, working with um, some people in practice, they've um, used EEG headsets to see how people think, feel about a VR uh, representation of a design. Um, of course, the driving headset is used with a view to alerting someone if their attention is slipping. Um, and there's a, you know, we're talking about an autonomous city, but cities are filled with people. And for some people with disabilities, uh, brain computer interfaces that allow them to interact with their homes or interact with a robotic feeding device or interact with, um, you know, platforms like, um, you know, Uber to, to get a car, to drive them. It can have a massive upside in restoring autonomy. So there's some brain implants. A small number of people around the world have got brain implants which get better signal and they get control over their devices. Uh, these are just in clinical trials at the moment rather than FDA or TGA approved, but they're massive potential for restoring autonomy to people. So there's big upsides. What about the downsides? So um, I think um, you know, one of the big questions is data. Of course, uh, brain reading devices collect data. It's a very intimate kind of data. What, what interests you? What excites you? What bores you? Uh, so you can, you know, so uh, perhaps the most famous neurotech company at the moment is Neuralink, which is famously owned by e Elon Musk, who also knows Twitter. And you can imagine combining data sets. People already know quite a lot about, you know, it's, it's possible to infer things about people from their Twitter feed. And then if you add neural data to it in the future, uh, then it, it might open up the door to sort of increase capacity to manipulate people, say, in... Uh, consumer context or perhaps in a political context. So that's a concern and anxiety about neurotech. Um, and, you know, maybe for a designer, you could, you know, like I'm, um, you know, I, I teach criminal law, and you could, 
you could, you know, you can think about design and its role in uh, sort of designing a crime or something like that. And you can imagine using an EEG headset to try and find out what kind of design sort of calms people down and designing in that way and sort of using it to kind of pacify uh, people in an urban space or a, some building. Uh, so, that, you know, that, maybe that's okay, but there's some ethical issues to be considered at least. Okay. Um, Another issue is neurotech divide. Some people have neurotech, some don't. Of course, neural devices might be hacked. That's an issue. So, you know, your brain data might, might go somewhere else where you don't want it to. Uh, or even, even worse than, say, in the criminal justice system, uh, you know, perhaps you, you, you might be, um, you know, one day it, it, might, it might be the case that... Um, it becomes a requirement to wear, have brain monitoring because humans are so fallible compared with autonomous cars, and so we need to have a brain monitoring if we want to get in a car. Or in a criminal justice context, um, you know, so uh, maybe a condition of uh, not going to jail is to have your brain monitored to um, monitor your brain at home if you're at risk of domestic violence or in a political context. Okay. Last slide, finally, um, so Chile has changed their constitution in response to this. They had a, a big change that failed in uh, 2022, but they had a smaller change in 2021 that got through. There's a big case based on it um, last month. Other countries are doing the same. The UN's involved. The Law Society of England and Wales published my paper on Eurotech and the legal profession. The Human Rights Commission here is uh, also interested, as has been said. I just want to say that there's massive upside to Neurotech, restoring on it autonomy and creating autonomous people, uh, but it, perhaps it's something for urban planners and uh, architects uh, to consider, as well as lawyers. Thanks very much. Thank you, Alan. I think the, that one might have scared quite a few of us here. Um, our final speaker um, that I'd like to invite up is uh, Professor Simon Marvin, and Simon will be doing a little bit of a response to some of the other um, presenters and sketch out some ways forward. Um, Simon is a fractional professor in the School of Architecture, Design and Planning at the University and director of the Urban Institute at Sheffield University. So his research interests focus on socio-technical change and the urban condition. He has recently competed, completed large collaborative projects on uh, the politics of urban transition, urban living labs and smart cities. And his latest book with Andres Luque Ayala, Urban Operating Systems, Producing the Computational City, was published by MIT Press as a freely available open access publication. So you can go and check that one out easily. His more recent work is focused on the development of interior climate control for humans, animals, and plants, charting the increasingly strategic role of technologically mediated climates constructed to ensure comfort, convenience, and survivability in a period of climate turbulence. And at, city, at Sydney, this work is focused on overheating cities, focused on understanding the dynamics, practices, and consequences of the outdoor cooling industry um, that through a range of socio-technical systems provide active cooling through misting, fog, and even air conditioning to try and guarantee outdoor comfort all year round. So Simon, have you come. Uh, thank you for that very nice introduction and, uh, and to the Henry Halloran Trust for sponsoring the event. What um, I want to try and do is just briefly reflect on the three fantastic presentations. Why, why should urbanists be concerned about platform technologies? And I was just sitting there thinking, when I trained to be an urban planner, we never really talked about digital technologies, ICTs. We wouldn't, and a platform would have been something you sat on rather than, um, <laughs> ra rather than this complex computational device. Uh, I thought the... I thought the uh, the, the, the first three presentations really bring home to us why as urbanists we need to be concerned and actually engaged in debates about platforms. 
Platforms are powerful. Platforms, they sort, they disaggregate, and they re-aggregate. They filter, they control. We interact with platforms in multi a multiplicity of ways. Every time we engage with public services or the private sector or use infrastructures, we, those, those relationships are mediated by platforms. There was a fantastic piece of work by a Washington think tank that traced the number of platforms uh, a low-income resident of Washington would be mediated by when they engage with the local authority. And there was 35 different platforms that mediated their access to different types of housing, welfare, food stamps, and services. These are incredibly powerful systems. They're often hidden, but they're obligatory. We have to engage with them. And I, was, I really was struck by Cecile's point about in a highly fragmented world, platforms seek to try to aggregate value and to filter our access to, to housing, to property tech, to other sorts of services. And I thought that was quite, in, I thought what was particularly interesting was that notion of emerging platforms. And I think, uh, Alan, in your talk, you could see the ways in which, I mean, one of the problems in the smart home sector is there isn't a platform, a single platform for engaging with your smart home. And you can see how these sorts of neurological technologies are of interest. As, people, as, as companies seek to provide ways of building an obligatory platform that mediates our access to these services. And also very nice the way in which Luke talked about that shift from the, di the sort of digital to the way in which these city brain systems claim to be able to ac actually manage urban space. Now, I think the thing that concerns me is that as urbanists, we're always behind the development of this landscape of platformization. And it, it, you know, are these platforms, are they infrastructures? Are they, are they just software systems? Or are they now becoming like the fundamental technologies and systems through which we interact with almost, with, with each other and with the public and the private sector? And I think there's a really significant expansion in the attempt to constitute platforms as, ob as obligatory systems for engaging with a variety of operational spaces. So we've been very focused on the notion of platforms as digital and computational systems. And I think increasingly they're being interwoven with particular sorts of spaces and places. And I think this gives them a very distinctive uh, urban dimension and why they should be of concern to uh, urban policy and urban scholars. So some of the work I've been doing with colleagues here in Sydney and in Sheffield is trying to understand the ways in which this is no longer solely about digital systems. It's also about robotics and automation and movement. It's about the ability of platforms not just to sort in a, in a sort of coding system, but for coding systems to control the manipulation of environments. And the best place to go for this, I, I love um, JB Hi-Fi and Bunnings. And if you want to see the emergence of these, sort of op these operational spaces, they're two of the best contexts to go to. I was in um, um, JB Hi-Fi, and the, the the number of smart home weather platforms. These are systems where you can have your own personal weather station. IBM operates a system of 250,000 of these weather stations. And there's a lot of work going on about trying to interconnect these weather stations with the control of the ambient environment in the home and uh, gardening automation products, uh, providing advice about whether or not it's safe to go outside. Um, home security platforms are using drone technologies in the, in, the, in the garden to be able to provide monitoring systems to protect the ambient environment around gardens. There's drone companies uh, experimenting with the notion of drones as service platforms, delivery robot platforms, the use of robotics in maintenance platforms. The new one that I've can't, uh, come across before is pet management, pet management platforms. Um, for controlling your pet's access to food, 
just stimulating it when you're at work. You can remotely control little sort of devices in your home. Um, and automated vehicle platforms. There's a huge amount of experimentation going on in, in, in attempting to constitute platform systems that will mediate the control of environments. How should urbanists respond to this new landscape? I think we need to recognise both the threats and the opportunities of, of these forms of platforming, as, as, we've, as we've heard from, other speak, from the other speakers as well. There's possibilities here for developing new capacities, but they also raise some quite difficult questions around privacy, access, further fragmentation, acceleration of inequality. I think we need to learn from automation platforms in other contexts. So the city, in some senses, is actually not a leader in automation and the use of platform technologies. You need to look outside the urban context into agri-tech, mining, maritime, and other sorts of logistical environments to understand where these platform systems are used and how they restructure social relationships. They simplify space in order, to in, in order, in order for these systems to work. And I think it's important to reassert social and environmental priorities to try to maximise the benefits from these experiments. Because unless we do that, um, we're not going to be able to maintain the possibility of getting progressive possibilities from these systems. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, I'd like to invite all of our panellists up to the um, stage, I guess that's what we call it. Um, and it's time for our Q&A session, so I hope you've been uh, thinking of some questions. But to kick us off, I'm actually going to start with one which was sent in prior to the panel. We've got a few here. But I might get you to start off with a touch briefly, I think, by Simon just before. Should urbanists fear new technology like AI or embrace it? I think that's a nice general. Should urbanists fear new technology like AI and some of the uh, stuff that we discussed today or embrace it? I think that's a nice broad opening question for the panel. I think everyone can have an opinion on that. Yeah. Whoever okay. wants to go first. I'll, I'll go for that. Um, I think we should be alert, alarmed and lean in. Um, I think... There's all sorts of configurations where we can use this in really great ways. So by just saying it's all not interesting to us, this is a fear of the unknown. And it's important we understand and are more aware of the landscape and can see the signs and can find our agency in it. So I think, um, I think I'd also be aware of who the baddies are who the system says the people that are the problem are, and who the system says the people are the saviours. I'd also say be aware of every, any, any platform or solution that says that it gives you freedom, because that's the first sales pitch. We all heard that with the Apple iPhone. We've heard it with all sorts of technology, and very soon it's acquired by a whole bunch of people, and it's the last thing you've got is freedom. It's dependency. Mm. Big difference. Um, so that's my take. I mean, I think you need to lean in, you need to be a part of it, be a digital, as if you are a digital native, but be aware. Um, just following up, following up from that, um, I agree, and I, I, I like your term about wonderment um, <laughs> and, and being a... Yeah, let's make it a word. Um, what did you say, technical po uh, optimist? It's the joy or, of, yeah, uh, oh yeah, optimist, realist. Well, yeah, op uh, realist optimist. Um, but I, I would add, you need always to be really critical about um, the, the potential consequences and, and uh, unintended consequences. So try to anticipate as much as possible what kind of um, effects or impacts they may have in society. But most importantly, asking yourselves why. Why, why to make use of uh, any new technology in the first place? And I think as Simon pointed out, there is uh, underlying the notion of any platform, there is the, uh, this notion of control. Mm -hmm. of gaining control over some something, some service, some process. Um, and sometimes that's desirable. I mean, it may save you time. It may, may make things safer. Um, and in other, time, uh, other occasions, that may not be so desirable. And it actually may lead to dependency and to potential exploitation of, of other people and, and other services of them, parts of society. 
Um, often we find it out by trying, and which is not a very good heuristics to, to use, um, because by the time we realize the, the damage that's done. So um, being critical about, about the potential of adding new technology, uh, trying that out in controlled environments potentially, and discussing that. I think, I think that's the most important thing, having events like this, having industry events that would uh, push the boundaries within a controlled community that is willing to, to try, um, try and, and, and the, the potential risks brought by that technology, but also being able to exert control over the technology itself before it goes too far. So, uh, yeah, I, th I think uh, both fear and embrace it. Um, I mean, you know, in, in terms of, in terms of uh, fearing it, you wouldn't want to get into a situation where the fear leads to some kind of regulatory environment where people are thwarted from regaining autonomy lost. You know, so some kind of inhibition of the therapeutic upsides of neurotech or, and the capacity to interact with homes was somehow thwarted by, by a fearful regulatory environment. Uh, but, but some fear is... Is, is, is merited, and, um, but there's a lot to embrace, you know, there's, you know, particularly on the, in relation to people who have difficulty getting around a city or getting around a home, there's a, quite a lot of um, potential upside, so um, embrace that. But uh, I think the, you know, the way of channeling the fear is maybe to sort of get a little bit of an anticipatory sta stance and start to, you know, as well as maybe not just going ahead and, and trying, but having a little bit of an anticipation of what could possibly go wrong and um, using that sort of channel the fear to kind of uh, produce um, more of the upside and less of the downside. It's... Um it always surprises me that we already live, live highly technologically mediated lives and how we always expect a new technology to solve the problems of a previous technology. And we're often very disappointed, actually. Um, and often what happens is that the transform transformative potentials are often not realized in practice, actually. And what tends to happen is a reinforcement of the status quo. Mm -hmm. And I suppose the, the, the hope the hope is that quite often society repurposes technologies in ways not envisaged by the developers of those systems. And there's the possibility, the progressive possibility of technology being used for other purpose, more progressive purposes. I, I might just add on to that what <coughs> Simon's saying. We are in a sort of liberal you know, there's a liberal capitalist framework we're in here. And so these companies are often owned by a small bunch of shareholders. And so what you've got to ask is what is their measure of success and who, we, you know, who is benefiting from the commercial aspect of this business? And I think we should also relax in that um, these sort of platforms have been around for a while and we're already exerting agency. I don't know how excited you were that you could turn off on your iPhone, um, the bit that was watching everything you were doing, and if you mentioned Porsche, you'd suddenly get an ad for a Porsche. Um, you can turn that off now. So the consumer voice and going, you know, you've overstepped. There's a value there and you've overstepped. I think we like to have cybersecurity and we like to have environmental benefits as a default. And after that, it's a negotiation. And just remember, it's let's make a deal. I'm trading off convenience for my rights. I don't want to have to bother doing that, so I'll just take that instead. Be aware of the trade-off you're making all the time, and is it better for you to actually write that rather than get ChatGBT to do it? And would you grow as a person? And would there be a slightly nuanced um, part in that that you're going to contribute to the world because you sat with that uncomfortableness? So we just have to make sure that our negotiation isn't our uncomfortableness because from our uncomfortableness is where creativity comes. Mm. So. I might use that with my students on the chat GPT. <laughs> whether... Sorry. Yep. Um, I will open out to questions if anyone has uh, from the audience. Yep. Um, look, it's fascinating that you can basically, I mean, 
I mean, there was no regulation, and I'll get into that in a second, but there was no regulation for, uh, you know, it was like it was going to be a fabulous new world and we're all going to be in the forum and we'll be chatting, etc. And then uh, we've gone international, so we've got national legislation, European and American and so on. But data is the real profit maker. And the question is then, how do you balance that creativity with rules that actually stop them using the data? And as we all know, the data comes from, the basis for it comes from the middle of the 19th century when eugenics was alive and it's crept through the military process into the civil process, etc. So there's biases there that exist that we're not necessarily aware of. So how do we get that balance between the creativity and the regulation? I'm sure you've got a simple answer to that. As, okay. Open to the panel. <laughs> As every good entrepreneur knows, um, you're always ahead of regulation. And you're running to get the opportunity. Um, and sometimes you're there to challenge the regulatory environment to push it forward. As we found with tiny homes, you know, it was difficult to build them because of the regulation. Co-housing, there wasn't an opportunity in the local council bylaws. Um, so, you know, regulation is so important. And even these big platforms have gone, we don't want to be regulators. You tell us what to do, okay? Because they don't want the accountability and the responsibility of it. But they're quite happy to have the global audience that that means, right? So I think we, regulation is, and policy is driven by our votes, right? It's driven by our say. Um, and local councils, I think, have a tremendous impact here. I really believe in the power of local and the conversation you have. I'm a big believer in, in really using your agency. I just find it interesting that now there's a lot of regulation coming in around these platforms um, that has been driven by as society's values to go, you know, you're too big. housing tenants, many of which um, don't have access to data, um, where you have people that quite often um, have difficulty even dealing with face-to-face -face services because of cognitive impairment and stuff like that. So I'm just interested how you throw an equity lens across this for those people that are most marginalised. I can understand how a middle-class person might have some agency, um, but there are people that don't have that agency and what's the role in this to uh, try and um, mm. mediate these systems so that they don't have adverse effects against those people that don't have that middle class agency? Um, so I'm, I might have, I mean, you, you mentioned cognitive impairment. So, you know, like what, I think maybe in my talk I sort of focused on uh, the issue of somebody with um, a physical impairment, um, and there might be some people that have got a physical impairment, if, the, if, if they're provided with resources, they could uh, mitigate the effects of it. But I think, um, you know, things like various forms of neurotech are, are now focused on cognitive impairment, uh, you know, so there's quite a lot of work going on uh, trying to address um, Alzheimer's, uh, by way of neurotechnological intervention. So it's possible if the thing ends up being distributed in a fair way, that some of the stuff I was talking about could kind of, um, uh, you know, kind of restore agency. But of course, it's a, it's a political question, isn't it? The question is, is going to be how much, uh, how much agency is the public purse willing to restore and that's, that's a political question, which is a harder one and beyond my... I mean, I, connecting that to the previous question and your question is, like, the process of innovation needs to be brought under some form of social control to some degree. And I was really struck by the innovation in the care sector around the use of these sorts of systems, robot, automation and robotic systems to help enhance and extend people's lives. It's expensive. It, it requires huge amounts of investment. Um, it needs to be done really sensitively, and it's not within the mainstream of the innovation process. 
a lot of these companies are very small. They're not like the, they're not like the defense robotics and the defense automation sector. Now, what can, what can cities do about that? There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a few, there's a few initiatives to try to think about. In the 70s, uh, the Dutch had this idea of science, science shops to try to sort of socialize science, and it was the origins of the citizen science sort of movement. Um, more recently, San Francisco, the city of San Francisco was trying to respond to a lot of tech companies experimenting on its streets with no regulation whatsoever. And they set up like an emerging technologies working group to try to bring some wider criteria into assessing who could, uh, who could have access to experiment in San Francisco. But it's almost too late. <laughs> you know, the problem is it's the, the, the companies have already established the systems they want to use. So I think that point about anticipatory or, construct, or constructive forms of technological assessment, we need to try to create a debate about how that, can, that debate can be opened up again in ways that it has at some points in the past, it needs to happen again. Can I just add a, a quick point thing. to that? So there's also a, a difference between private platforms or privately accessible platforms that may be tried out as a, as a proof of concept among investors uh, and publicly broad platforms. Because you're right in the sense that the, um, the people at the bottom of the society may be powerless in, in regards to not only having access or being given access to platforms, but also be, they're gonna be subject, I mean, that data is gonna be collected regardless. Right? If it's a publicly rolled out platform, they are gonna be contributing with their data to the, to the enrichment of this platform and development without necessarily getting anything back. And then there is a very important equity um, uh, in a, uh, issue in there, um, which has to be the role of civil, civil society, but also the government to intervene. And that's where regulation <coughs> often can step up to, 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 in a way, to, to bring things to a more equal state. Okay. Also, oh, yeah. sorry. I was just going to say, we're, we're at time, so we might have to stop responding to those ones there, but perhaps you can continue I, that afterwards. I just oh, want yes. to speak to, to yeah, you, okay. if that's okay. So, but I, no, no, I was just going to get you 30 seconds and I'll give everyone a last word opportunity. So maybe if you want to respond. Quickly. I was just going to say we, we forget the power of an intergenerational opportunity. And um, my daughter, who is an entrepreneur and works in this space, created a little workshop called Tech Tea and Tales. And you came with your phone and what you wanted to have answered about your phone and your confusions about your phone and what you could access, especially in terms of medical and everything. And you had a cup of tea and you could record your story all in the same experience. This is for older Australians, older than me. Um, and <laughs> It was a really, really powerful opportunity um, to, you know, really create that cohesion. So I'll keep saying that belonging is not connectedness, and sometimes we think it has to be a tech solution, but the old-fashioned, you know, analog experiences can sometimes deliver a deeper engagement and create agency at the same time. Okay, great, thank you. So, final question to each panelist for a very quick last word, and that is, if you could offer one prediction about how we'll be talking about platforms or AI in cities in 10 years from now, what would it be? <clears throat> Anyone can jump in. <laughs> 10 years. Uh, I'll try, I'll go first. I mean, I'll, I, you know, I think, I think there'll be some kind of, um, some kind of response from, from platforms to interacting directly with the ner nervous system. And so there'll be something comes out of, you, you know, like Facebook have got a neural interface company. Elon Musk has got the social media, the neurotech one, and there'll be some kind of platform that comes that way. Excellent. That's a good one to kick off with. Any? I have two potential yeah. visions for, for the future. I think in one, one potential pathway, we're going to be talking about platforms as we talk about the internet and or social media is just a fact of life and is in, embedded on everything we do, uh, particularly with artificial intelligence. And we just lived, learn to live with it and make amendments as we go. Um, and many people will, will suffer and uh, the dire consequences of, of it uh, as we go along. And we're going to be reflecting on the, on the lessons learned and trying to correct path, paths as we go. The other potential scenario, and they are not necessarily mutually exclusive, is that we will start to 
uh, try to regain control as a society over some of the abuses that the corporations and, and governments rolling out these platforms uh, are, are, are engaging in. And we, we will become uh, positively paranoid about uh, data that's being linked out into the world. And um, we start to doubt everything, particularly with, uh, again, the emergence and proliferation of deep fakes and, and fake news and so on. And gatherings like this, face-to-face -face where we actually engage in discussions that are verified, uh, we will become more popular. So we may actually turn off from platforms that re-engage uh, uh, in face-to-face -face conversations. Yep. Very quick, Simon and, oh, sorry. and Cecile. Yeah, very yep. quick. <laughs> Disappointment. <laughs> so every sort of technological logic that comes along is going to transform life. It's going to make decision making more effective. It's going to save the planet. It will be fairer and more just. And actually, not that much really changes, and we'll be quite disappointed. Good and Cecile. Um, Something, you're, what, are, what do you describe yourself as? Uh, what type of optimist? Uh, yeah, a re, uh, I'm a realist optimist. Um, I believe our human collections will be even more valuable. Um, I believe our entrepreneurs are going to be leading into our ageing population and are going to be providing some really interesting solutions to um, housing affordability and achievability. Um, and I think, but I think the human, the human to nature, I think this is where the balance of those worlds will be. I think, I think, yeah, both are incredibly important. Okay, great. Well, thank you um, to all of our panelists today and for the audience and again to the Henry Halloran Trust for sponsoring this session. Um, we have some drinks in the foyer uh, ahead of the next Festival of Urbanism event, um, which is on contested environments, if you're hanging around for the double header. Um, but I'd like you to join me in thanking the panelists. Thank you. <laughs>